Philippians chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble for me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. The word of the Lord. Can I be honest with God? How do I tell my girlfriend about God? What does God have planned for my life? God, why do you feel so far away? What does God think about sex? How am I supposed to pray to God? And what does he expect from me? Where do I go from here? Well, in just a moment, I will answer the question from the ancient wisdom of the Bible. The question is, how can I know God? And so that's where we're dealing with. That's why you were read that text from the book of Philippians. Keep your Bibles open. We'll get there in just a minute. Um, but this uh, weekend, and really tomorrow specifically, is set aside to remember the legacy, mission, and dream of doc Dr. Martin Luther King. And so I want to... Um, challenge us just for a minute on that, and I want us to pray. Um, we live in a very racially divided city, um, and you don't know this a lot of times if you're in the majority of culture, i.e. you're white, okay? You're, you're kind of oblivious to this, but when you talk to your friends who uh, have a little more flavor than you and uh, a little more color than you, you discover very quickly they live in a different world than we live in, and so um, one of the goals of our church is to help us not only connect the gospel to our personal lives, which is why we're doing this series where God, we're really going to God with the questions we have. God loves to, to deal with that on a personal level. But there are also corporate issues that we must address. And one of those issues is race. And so I want to personally challenge you to think corporately, okay? I want to challenge you to think about what it would look like for you uh, as a follower of Jesus, to bring the gospel into your world in such a way that it literally turns upside down some of these issues of race that plague our city. And I don't know what that looks like. I don't know where you work. I don't know where you live. I don't know who your friends are. I don't know anything about it. But what I do know is this, um, you can make a difference. Um, and, and I want, I want to challenge you with that. I don't know what that looks like. Okay. We're going to pray and let, we'll let God sort all of that out. But this is a big time, and, and I want to bring awareness. We planted the church eight years ago, and one of our visions was that our church would reflect our city, and it hasn't yet. That our church would not only reflect our city, but that it would reflect heaven, where there will be people from every tongue, every tribe, every race. And so we want, yeah, amen, that's a good thing to clap for. So, so we want to see what that looks like. And we can talk about, oh, it'd be great if things happen, you know, in our city and in our country and everybody will get emotional. There'll be all kinds of cool video tomorrow. That'll be great. Okay, that'll be great. 
a lot of basketball games, which I like, okay, that'll be great, but it starts with us, okay? So let's pray and let's ask God to speak to us. Father, we are grateful for the dream of Dr. King. We are grateful for his life. We know he was not a perfect man, but he had such a vision of what could be. And we know, God, that, there, that though there is great steps that have been made in education and in policy and in attitudes, God, there is still so much uh, to go. So there, there, there's a long way to go. And we ultimately believe, as followers of Jesus, that the answer for the, for the reconciliation for races is not found in education or policy. It's found in the gospel. So, Lord, would you show us what it looks like? to be agents of reconciliation, um, not, not simply racially, but spiritually, but also racially. God, that we would be people who seek to love no matter what the color of skin is, that we would be people who serve no matter where someone came from, that we would be people who look like Jesus as we go out into our world. That's the vision of Dr. King, that people would be treated equally, that they would understand their creator has made them uniquely, and so God, send us out in that power, and we trust you to use us in our great city. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so one of the reasons why this passage is so important is that it reveals one of the things that all of us kind of intuitively know, um, and that is religion in general takes people away from God instead of bringing them to God. Now, now, you know that, right? And in some levels, you can look at like extremists and uh, uh, certain uh, Christians that you know, perhaps, and you go, yeah, that's not very attractive. Some of you have felt that. Some of you have actually experienced that, and, and you haven't been in church in years, maybe decades, because of that. You've seen the harm and abuse of religion. But I want to zero in and not just think about it out there. I want you to think about it for yourself even right now and think about how dangerous it is because you have a Bible in your lap. And, and I don't know if you've thought about this, but it is a dangerous thing to read the Bible. It, it's a dangerous thing to pray. This is a dangerous place to be, church. Now, why would you say that, Darren? Here's why. It is easy to be deceived into thinking because I'm doing God stuff. Or, or I'm coming to a God place that I'm really knowing and growing in God. It is so easy to substitute religious practice for God's presence. And this text absolutely challenges us to kind of check ourselves, to test our spirituality. Is it simply practice or is it real? Is it more about doing stuff for God or is it about knowing God? Now Paul is almost apologetic in verse 1. If you look at it, he's like, okay, uh, I'm basically telling you stuff I've already talked to you about, my translation. He says, to write the same things to you is no trouble for me and it's safe for you. What he's saying is, listen guys, we've been talking in correspondence and preaching and teaching, I've told you the very things that I'm getting ready to tell you, but you need to hear it again. And now this is very hard for us because we live in, in this world that says, if I heard it once, I understand it completely. We really believe down deep that if, that, that if we hear something, uh, give some kind of mental assent about it, we, we wrap our brains around it a little bit, we, we, we understand it. We've even developed a phrase over the last couple years, right? I got this. Hear that? I got this. What's that about? Well, that exposes kind of an underlying philosophy that we have as Americans that, that we, we think there, that if, you know, if I kind of understand it a little bit, I've really got it in total. What the Bible does is it shatters that notion because the Bible is painfully repetitive. And what I mean is it says the same things in different ways. So you read along in the Bible and you're like, well, I've heard this before. Yeah, about 20 times. But it's a different story, it's a different genre, it's a different concept, it's a different metaphor used to communicate the very same truth. Why would God do that? Because we're hard-headed and hard-hearted. We don't get the truth, we don't want the truth, so God keeps beating on us over and over and over again. And that's really what Paul is saying here. Listen guys, I'm gonna be painfully redundant here and tell you the same things that you already know. And here's what I've discovered in my Christian life, and maybe you have too. Sometimes the most important truth 
is the truth I thought I already knew. Sometimes the most impactful truth in my life, the thing that just turns the light on, that changes everything, is the thing I thought I learned five years ago. Right? And so over and over and over again, the Bible says you should love God, you should worship God, you should delight in the Lord, you should serve God. All of these different things saying the same thing. Paul continues in that train of logic and he says, I want you to know God, verse 10, but I'm going to get into your imagination a little bit. I want you to learn to rejoice in the Lord. Okay, verse 1. How do you rejoice in the Lord? That's Paul's kind of question that he's engaging us with. What does it look like to take joy in God alone? What does it look like to delight in the Lord? Now we know this is his theme because he starts off verse one. What's the very first word of verse one in chapter three? When you see it, shout it out. What's the first word? Finally, this is the last matter he's taking up. That's an adverb. It's a transitional phrase going, all right, guys, I've talked to you about all this stuff for a couple chapters. Let me get to the guts of what I want to talk to you about. Let me get to the meat. Let me tell you what I really want you to know, what I really want you to live, and what I really want you to know and live is rejoice in the Lord. Now, this gives us a key as we think about what it means to know God. Because to know God, according to Paul, is to rejoice in the Lord. To rejoice in the Lord. Now, you don't use that word much, do you? Rejoice. How many of you enjoyed your cup of coffee or your 12 cups of coffee this morning? Raise your hand and be proud, caffeine addict. Raise your hand, yes, thank you. Some of us actually held our cups up. Thank you for that. Okay. Okay, so, so I'm sure you enjoyed it. I'm sure it was awesome. I'm quite sure no one said, I rejoiced in my cup of coffee this morning. You don't use that word much. But in the Bible, it's used a lot. In the book of Philippians, it's the key word, actually. And what does it mean to rejoice? Well, it means literally to take joy in, right? It means to, to, to rely on. Like it's something that just kind of comes out of you because the object of your rejoicing is so wonderful, your joy just kind of spills out onto it. Rejoice in the Lord is what Paul says. Now, um, for, for, for a long time, um, and, and mo- a lot of men are like this, right? Um, I lived, and I can still tend to do this, I tended to live my life right here. This communicates. Right in my head. And what I love about the Bible is it will just not let us settle um, in our our little distinct personalities. Um, And and, and so it doesn't just say no God, although it does say that, verse 10, right? No God. Uh, But when you hear no immediately it goes cognitive, doesn't it? Well, I, know some, I need to know some facts. I need to know some information. You get all cerebral and you think, oh, no God, no information, no Bible verses, no theology, no stuff. But then he comes back on the other end and goes, rejoice. See, that gets into your heart. And, and, and some of you struggle, like me, you struggle that 18 inches from your head to your heart. And Paul is saying, if you want to know God, You have to engage him on an emotional level. Not an irrational level, but a supra-rational level. God wants us to use our brains, but you are more than just your brain. And God wants to engage all of you. That's why he says, rejoice. Now, I've looked for definitions for years of what it means to rejoice. Because especially dudes reading the Bible, they don't like that word. Because it makes them think they got to get emotional and and not be in control. And so I'm like, how do I communicate to a dude how you, what, how do you do this, right? How do you rejoice in the Lord? I found a definition. Now it may not be very doodly for some of you, but it was very helpful for me. This is Tim Keller. This is what he says. He says, what you rejoice in is the thing that is your central sweetness and consolation in life. Okay. Uh, So, so the idea is this, what you will rejoice Uh, It just depends on what you rejoice in. You you cannot not rest in something. There is something that's getting your rejoicing, right? There's something that's getting, that's getting that. Okay, keep reading. To rejoice is to treasure a thing, to assess its value to you, to reflect on its beauty and importance until your heart rests in it and tastes the sweetness of it. To know God is to rejoice in God. 
So, so, so don't think you can relegate God to your brain. He wants to engage your heart because if he just engages your brain, it never gets into your heart and you know, you know where it never gets out through your life. But God wants to engage your head, your heart, out through your life. To know God is to rejoice in God. Now the object is important here. We rejoice in the Lord, right? That's, what's, that's who's supposed to get our rejoicing, the Lord. Now, now there's reasons for this. Uh, number one, the word Lord means master. So Paul's reasoning goes something like this. All right, you might as well find your central sweetness, your, 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 your main consolation. You might as well go ahead and rejoice in the one who created everything, owns everything, and controls everything. That just makes sense. Like if you're going to rejoice, which you are, because you're a human being, and you will, why don't you just go ahead and rejoice in God? Right? He is the Lord. Now here's what's beautiful about our Lord. He's not just the Lord of all. He's the Lord of you, right? He, he, he's not just God of everything. He's God of you. He's not just controlling all things. He is interested in you. He wants to know you. He's inviting you in a relationship with him. He's personal. You, you are his. He, you belong to him. He's your master. But he is yours because you're his choice servant. Rejoice in the Lord. Now, Paul's not making a suggestion here. Right? This is an imperative, which means do it. Well, God, I'm tired. Rejoice in the Lord. God, I don't feel like it. Rejoice in, it's not an option. You do it, right? And it, that's one imperative. Now look at the other imperative in, this, uh, in the first couple of verses. Look in verse two. Look, which is an imperative, look out for the, what's the word? Look out for the, look out for those who, those are all imperatives. Look, look, look. Watch out, watch out, watch out. Now here's what he's doing. He's pitting two things against one another. Rejoicing in God or joy and religion. Those two things are diametrically opposed. And remember, this is his final point. This is his main theme. This is the thing he's trying to get through to this church. If you haven't heard anything I've said, it's as if Paul's saying, make sure you rejoice in God and make sure you avoid religion. Make certain that you do not fall into the legalistic self-righteousness that is so prominent in the human heart. And the only way you're going to do that is to rejoice in God. The gospel says we rejoice in God. Religion says we rejoice in ourself. So if you're going to know God, you've got to learn to reject religion, period. And here's your temptation, church person, church folk. I like using that word. Say, so how do I know if I'm a church folk? You're in church right now. You're a church folk, Okay. That's you. Here's your temptation. Once again, you will rejoice in something. Your temptation as a church person, you may be a Christian, you may not be, your temptation is to not rejoice in God, but in your commitment to God. You missed it. Did you hear the difference? Your temptation is to not rejoice in God, but in your commitment to God. That's religion. That's religion. That's where you rejoice literally in yourself. Your confidence is in your religious activity, your spiritual performance, your commitment. The vast number of people who come to church, this is what they do. And so you say, well, what does that matter? Well, Paul says, that's dog behavior. Watch out. Watch out. Watch out. And then he calls these folks dogs. Now, I love the Bible because it's just not very politically correct, is it? Uh, you know, you read the book of Proverbs, writer Proverbs, mainly a dad writing to his son. He's like, uh, Sons, son, look out. There's a bunch of whores in the world. Watch out. There's a bunch of fools. There's a bunch of lazy people, sluggards. You're like, oh, that's the Old Testament. God was really angry in the Old Testament. Jesus always had a smile on his face, right? He was feathered hair and a hippie in a nice robe. Jesus would never, here's what Jesus said to people. You're snakes. You're, you're, you're a brood, the old King James, the brood of viper. You're hypocrites. You're twice the sons of hell. I'll send you to hell once and then again, right? This is what he said. 
So Paul, following a long line of, of the Bible being very direct, he says, your dogs. Now, when we hear dog, we think sweet, domesticated <laughs> dog, right? That's my dog. That's Augie, right? This is what we think. In the first century, when they heard dog, they would not have thought of this kind of dog. They would have thought of more this kind of dog, more like a coyote, a wolf, because they traveled in packs. They went, they, they went into places that you did not want them. They tore things apart. This is one of the worst put downs Paul could possibly use. It's not offensive to us, extremely offensive to them. And, and, and in case they didn't get it, he says, you're evildoers. You mutilate the flesh. Now, let me camp out here for a second. This is going to help many of you who are reading the Bible through for the first time because you keep, keep seeing this C word everywhere, circumcision. And, 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 and some of you guys get real uncomfortable when you read that word because you start thinking about it, right? And get, it makes you feel weird inside. And, and so let me just explain to you what this is and why it's all over the Bible, all over the Bible. He's doing a play on words here in verse two when he says those who mutilate the flesh. The Greek word for circumcision okay, is the word paratome, which literally means to cut around. His play on words in verse two is the word um, katatome, which means to cut into pieces, or hence the translation mutilate. And here's what he's saying. Legalism wounds you spiritually. It cuts you where you, do, you really don't want to be cut, right? It, it hurts you where you don't want to be hurt. It deceives you where you don't want to be deceived. And what Paul is saying, he's not speaking abstractly, he's speaking personally. This is what happened to me. I'm telling you what happened to me. Religion just about drained all the spiritual life out of me. I was deceived by, by my religious activity. I was deceived by my religious heritage. And here's what is really difficult, guys, as you begin to walk with God and know God, is the very same practices that seem to bring you near to God can eventually take you away from God. This is the danger of religion. Now, this is the whole circumcision thing. Circumcision was literally God's mark on God's people to remind them that they were his. It's, it's as if, now think about this, very patriarchal society in the, in the Old Testament. And God says to Abraham and his, and his family, I'm going to mark you on your sexuality so that you will never forget who owns you. Now, every time, think, think about Abraham's family, every time they use the bathroom, every time sexual intercourse, every, they, are, they remember, God, God owns me. My, my, my life is not my own. I'm in, I'm in a covenant relationship with this God right? So, so, so it wasn't just like some deal. It, it was a symbol, right, of God's ownership. Uh, it was a physical reminder of whose they were and where they were to take joy and, who, and to whom they were to take joy in. That was circumcision. It was an external physical work that reminded them of God's ownership and a focus to where they should take their joy. Now, in the New Testament, God says, it's a little different. In fact, even in the Old Testament, God pictures a time where it wasn't a physical thing, it was a spiritual thing. It wasn't what God would do in externally, it would, it, it's about what God does internally. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 30, I want us to read this together. Deuteronomy 30 verse 6, let's read it. The Lord your God will circumcise your heart so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart. So it's a picture, it's a future of what God would do. So it's not a physical thing, it's a spiritual thing. It's not a male thing, it's a child of God thing. So circumcision was a good thing. But here's what happened in the first century to, to the people that Paul was writing. Circumcision became a mark, not of God's ownership, but became a mark of legalistic self-righteousness. Well, well, we're God's chosen. You're not. No matter what you do, you'll never be where we are. And we have these rules that we keep that you could never keep, right? And so circumcision, a good thing, became a bad thing. And this is why religious heritage, religious practices, and, 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 and everything we do when it comes to God's stuff is so dangerous because we can begin to take joy in our religious activities instead of God. And that always takes us away from God. Always. 
And Paul says, you want a test case? Look at my life. I was unbelievably religious and not very spiritual. I thought I was doing good things, but in the end, it was taking me far from the heart of God. And then he lists verses four through six. He says, I was circumcised the eighth day of the people of Israel, meaning he wasn't a convert. He wasn't what was called a God-fearer. He was born a Jew, right? Of the tribe of Benjamin, one of two tribes that was faithful to King David. What's he talking about? Racial purity. This is a very racist statement. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews, meaning that most of the Jews in the first century had been what was called Hellenized. They had adopted Greek culture, not Paul. So not only is he racially pure, he's culturally pure. I'm, I, as to the law, he says, I was a Pharisee, meaning not only did he keep the 10 commandments, he kept the 613 commandments that helped keep you from breaking the 10 commandments. As to zeal, I persecuted the church. Not only did I practice my religion faithfully, anybody that I thought was harmful, i.e. Christians, I made sure they were destroyed. So this guy was religious with a capital R and he said, this kept me from knowing God. Then you say, well, I, you know, that doesn't really apply to me. You're misunderstanding what religion, I know there's a ver, what religion is. I know there's a verse in James. Um, those of you who are Bible scholars, your bells are ringing. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. James 1, 27 says we are to, true religion is to take care of widows and orphans in their distress and to keep ourselves uh, unstained from the world. I know that's not how I'm using it. I'm using it the way Paul's using righteousness here in Philippians 3. And here's what religion is, according to my definition. It's trying to please God solely by your own spiritual performance. It's what Paul calls a righteousness from the law. God is pleased with me because I do this or that, or I don't do this or that. And here's what's weird about it. You don't have to be religious to have religion. You really don't. Uh, Okay, so I didn't grow up in church, didn't know Bible verses, Family w- weren't into church at all, um, and, but, I, but I had religion. And here's what, I, here's what I mean by that. I had this thing in my mind that if I did this or didn't do that, me, me, and, me and the big man were okay, okay? So here was my life, honestly. As I reason, and, I, and I've thought about this for years, actually. I thought, I got in fights a lot. Shocking, I know. Those of you who've heard me speak, I mean, I, I'm getting, I get, my, my, my mouth gets me in trouble. And so I got a lot of fights, but here was my deal. I never gave any, anyone a beating who didn't deserve it. <laughs> I wasn't a bully, right? And for a time, for, for a little under a year, I sold drugs. I'm not proud of that, but that's, that's a real part of my past. But here was my deal. I don't sell drugs. Drugs sell themselves, Right? So, so I'm actually protecting people because my stuff is not, I don't have weird chemicals in it. Some of my buddies were selling oregano like it was weed. I'm not deceiving people. I had a righteousness. I had a religion about this. I'm not kidding. I'm not making this up. Right? I was the link. This was my social righteousness, my social religion. I was the link between the jocks and the druggies because I was a jock and I was a druggie. And so I was bringing peace and harmony to our school. Right? <laughs> Now you laugh and it is funny and I'm exaggerating a little bit, not much, but that was my religion because that is the thing that I said, because I don't cheat people on the drugs, because I don't give people a beating who didn't deserve it, because I am socially trying to bring people together, not you know, races and different socioeconomic classes, because of all that God, accept me, that's my religion. That's, that, that's what I was, that was my spiritual performance whereby I said to God, because I'm doing this stuff, accept me, love me, do me right, right? And here's the thing, and you need to know this about your own heart, even if you're a Christian, that whole thing, because of this God, accept me, that's the screensaver for your heart. That's where you default back to. If you don't do anything, right, your screen, I guess they, you know, maybe some of your computers don't have that, mine still has a screensaver, it comes, if you don't do anything, that's what happens your heart will always drift that way. And Paul knows this, and so he's challenging us. And so you have to be radical. If you're going to know God, if you're going to get to know God, you're going to have to reject religion. Now, along those lines, to know God is to lose confidence in your own spiritual performance. To lose confidence. Look in verse 7. If you're memorizing 
Scripture. This is a good one to start with. Verse 7. For whatever gain I had. He's not talking about money. He's not talking about career. He's talking about his religion. Whatever gain I had. Verse 7. Look at it. I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ, my, Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all thing, things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. Now, we're not British, so that doesn't really communicate. The word is the word for crap, for dung. Insert your own word. That is what his religion meant to him. Keep reading, that I may gain Christ, verse 9, and be found in him, not having a religion or a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Paul is saying, I came to realize I could not save myself with my own good heart, my own good works, and my own great intentions. I could not be my own savior as moral and religious as I was. I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. Verse three, I think, maybe, um, I, I read it for years and I didn't understand all this worship by the Spirit of God and all in the, the circumcision thing through me. But then I read this first and, and it, it, there's other translations of the Bible other than the one in your lap. And modern translations are good. There's, there's different strengths and weaknesses to them. We can, we can trust them that they're communicating to us God's word. But the New Living Translation of verse 3 is unbelievable. It says, we, for we who worship by the Spirit of God, are the ones who are truly circumcised. We rely on what Christ Jesus has done for us, not what we do for him, implication. We put no confidence in human effort. None. None. Now let me go old school. Let's go back about 300 years or so. Um, Nathan Coles. Middleburg, Connecticut, 1733. He's a farmer. He's kind of minding his own business. I was in the field at work, he says, and then I heard. I dropped my tool and I ran home to my wife, telling her to make ready. I, with my wife, soon mounted the horse and went forward as fast as the horse could bear. Have you guys seen True Grit yet? Anybody? Okay. This will be, this, I'm not running the story, okay, so relax. Some of you are like, la, 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 don't do that. I'm not, I'm not going to run it. <laughs> do you remember the horse scene where he's riding the horse? I won't say anything else, and the horse kind of gives out. That's the picture I get. It's fast as the horse could bear, this guy and his wife. When we arrived there, there were several thousand people there, and thousands more were riding to the town with us. When I heard Mr. Whitfield speak... His sermon gave me a heart wound. By God's blessing, my, own, my old foundations were broken up and I saw that my righteousness could not save me. Now the guy he was going to hear was George Whitfield, who used to preach to crowds of 30,000 people without a microphone, without amplification. Literally changed our whole country. It's called the Great Awakening. Right? And this is what Whitfield used to say. Religious people can repent of their sins, but only Christians can repent of their righteousness. See, anybody can modify their behavior and stop doing sin stuff, but only a Christian can repent of the reason they're giving to God why he should bless them apart from Jesus. Only Christians can do that. Only Christians can say, I've counted everything as loss. None of my good works are gonna matter None of my good intentions mean anything. The only thing that matters, the only thing that's going to bring me near to God is Jesus and his right standing with God, his righteousness alone. Christians repent of the reason they are giving God to accept them other than Jesus. That's what it means to be a Christian. Right? So here's a big question for you. What is your righteousness? What is your religion? What is that thing that you hold up to God and say, God, because of this, right, accept me. Now, last thing, and I love verse 10. Look at verse 10. That I may know him. All of this stuff he said is his unto this. That I may know him and the power of his resurrections and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. Here's the thing. I, I get asked, um, 
questions a lot. At, you know, people don't know I'm a pastor, so I ride airplanes and kind of meet people in public, and, and they ask me, like, what do you do? And then it's always fun to say, well, I'm a pastor, and then to look at the expression on their face as they recall all the curse words they have said and try to apologize for that or whatever just happened in the preceding moments. Um, <laughs> it's, always, it's always fun for pastors. Um, but they'll get to asking me, okay, so where's your church? Like, well, it's kind of hard to answer. It's kind of all over the city. We have four locations. It's kind of weird, and they kind of look at me weird, and it's the journey, and they're like, what kind of freaky cult is that? You know, you kind of see it in their head. So it's kind of hard to answer, but, but, but the, my, in, in that train of questioning, oh, so you pastor a church? I'm like, yes, I, I actually started this church eight years ago. My wife and I moved here to St. Louis to plant this church, to start this new church. And sometimes the question comes, well, why? There's churches everywhere. Why would you? And I'm tempted to like go to like study, which is real. Like nine out of 10 people do not attend a local church, which is true, like in our city. And so um, on a meaningful basis and a regular basis. And, but, but, but a lot of times I just like to go, um, Jesus told me to. <laughs> Jesus told you to. Interesting. Yeah. Um, he was dead and now he's not. I mean, if somebody gets out of a grave, you're going to listen to him, right? He told me to move to this city and plant this church. Now, here's my question. Do you really believe that? I, and maybe not the part about me coming and planting the church. That, that, that's maybe up for debate in your mind. But do you really believe he got out of the tomb? If you really believe that. See, here's what Paul's doing in this last verse. He started with this idea of engaging our emotions. He's doing it again, friends. Because he because he's talking about suffering and he's talking about death and he's talking about the power that is in you because of Christ's re resurrection. He's saying to know God is to tap into that. And that is not an unemotional event. Do you think those disciples, when they knew Jesus got out of that tomb, were like, oh, that's really nice. I I'm glad I had that information in my head. I'll add to all the other Old Testament verses, and now that's confirmed, all those prophecies. That's wonderful. It rocked them internally. And see, you, you start tapping into this. Verses like this make sense in the Psalms. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Or the other one, my soul thirsts for God, for the living God. He's alive. I'm dry, I'm weary. What I really want is not an iPad, it's God. That's what I want. And it's possible because of the resurrection. What's gonna fill my soul is not watching a stupid three hour football game or having season tickets with the car. It's God and it engages all of who I am. This connection leads to an experience with God. When you understand the resurrection power, this is Paul's whole point. And some of you are like, okay, Nice preaching, but I'm not prone to the emotional stuff. I'm very smart and intelligent, and I have many degrees, and I work at Wash U, and I work in it, or whatever your thing is, and I don't really get into all the emotional stuff. It kind of makes me uncomfortable. It's kind of the reason I like coming to the journey, because you don't really make me kind of engage that way too much. I can kind of hang out. And so it kind of, I, I, I'll, I, I, I buy some of the stuff, but I can't really do that. Uh, I'm too smart. Let me read to you from another guy who was kind of smart. First president of Princeton University. He wrote 300 books in his lifetime, many of those still in print 300 years later. Jonathan Edwards writes from a sermon called A Divine and Supernatural Light. He writes, there is a difference between having an opinion that God is holy and gracious and having a sense of that loveliness and beauty that is holiness and grace. There is a difference between having a rational judgment that honey is sweet and having a sense of the sweetness. You can look at honey in a jar and, and imagine, but when that, thing, when that honey is on your tongue, right? We can talk about who God is and have Bible verses and understandings in our head, but when you experience God, it's different. It's different. You say, well, I don't know that guy. He sounds like, you know, some kind of Christian guy that dealt with theology and all that stuff. I, I'm in the sciences. I, I'm real 
linear. I have a scientific mindset. Let me read to you from somebody you may have heard. If you haven't, shame on you, because if you're in the science realm, you're standing on his shoulders right now. His, his understanding of the world led to what is now the scientific method. Okay? This is Blaise Pascal. The, he was a mathematician as well as a theologian. And this is from his journal entry. I'll read it. In the year of grace, 1654, Monday, 23rd November, from half past 10 in the evening till half an hour after midnight, two hours, 15 minute experience. This is what he writes. Fire, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob, not of the philosophers and the learned. Certainty, joy, certainty, emotion, sight, joy, forgetfulness of the world and all that is outside of God. The world has not come to know thee, but I have come to know thee. Joy, 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 tears of joy. My God, will you leave me? Let me never be separated from you. I know you're smart, some of you. That doesn't take you off the hook for meeting God like that man met God. That doesn't mean that he can't engage your heart. He can engage your heart. So don't think, okay, I'm, I'm thinking about taking this Christianity thing up. You will not, but it will take you up. It's not something you decide. Well, I think I'll follow Jesus. It's something you're drawn into. It's bigger than you. It didn't start with you. It started with God. And you're not pursuing God as much as he's pursuing you. And he's not pursuing you to just give you some nice God ideas to get you to do some nice God activities in a nice God place. He's, he's pursuing you so that you will know him with your whole being. He wants all of you. And what religion does is it says, God, you stay right there on Sunday morning and I'll pick you up next week. This is not the experience of the folks in the Bible. This is not the experience of what God is doing all over the world. Like in China, for instance. In 20 years, there will be more Christians in China than people in the United States. 1948, they kicked all the, the white missionaries out. And you know what the Western church world said? And you know what the communists said? And you know what the whole world said? Well, Christianity's done in China. It's spreading like wildfire. What, you know why? Because they're meeting God. They're experiencing the power of the resurrection. God is not an abstraction to them. God is not an add-on. God is not just an activity that they do for a short time once a week. It's something that encompasses their whole life and they're not bored and they're not way overweight and they're not overly entertained and they're not have, they don't have tons of conflict and buy crap they don't need. That's not how they live. They see reality as it is. Why? They know God. So when this gets a hold of you, you know what happens? You stop being casual about your faith. Some of us are so casual. Take it or leave it. Well, it's just an, th that all goes out the door when you meet God like this. Well, I, you know, I'll think about serving in the church. Now, that, that kind of goes. I'll think about, you know, surrendering my life. Well, you know, Darren, religion is a private matter. All that is gone when you meet God this way. It just is. Now, you can choose to stay religious, and many of, it, many of you will, but you will be bored, and if you do pretty well, you will be self-righteous and judge everybody around you that's not doing as well as you will. That's called normal church. You will become that, right? And you'll pick up some good tips, and you'll pick up some inspiration once a week, but it will not change your life, and God will feel distant, and when crisis hits your life, you will not feel like God is near And when your marriage jacks up, which it will, you know, who, you know the people that are struggling in their marriage, right? The people who are married. So it will happen. Your kids will misbehave. They will rebel. Some of you will get cancer. What are you going to do then? Go to church? Come on. You were made for more than that. You're not, you're not just punching the clock. You were made to be consumed by the God of the universe. You were made to walk in the power of the resurrection. You were made to be able to suffer in a way that Jesus did. How? For the joy that was set before him. That's how you were made. 
That's what, you, that's what Christianity is. Don't buy all this American junk, right? That's not Christianity. That's self-help. That's if you, you know, do, do a little God stuff and he'll, get, he'll give you, you know, great, a great life and make you healthy and what. Don't believe that stuff. I don't care who comes in town. Don't believe that stuff. That's not what the Bible teaches. There's a cross, but Jesus went to the cross for the joy that was set before him. That's what you can experience. And that's exactly what I want to pray that you see and that I see it. God for who he is, wanting all of who we are all the time. Let's pray. So Lord, I ask for myself and my friends that you would help us to see that you are worthy of our rejoicing, that we can rest our life in you, that we can find our central sweetness, our consolation, our comfort, our hope in you. Forgive us, Lord, for giving ourselves to lesser things, that our hope would be in a new job or a new house or a new relationship or a, a new game or a new season. God, let us, let us see you and, and find you the way the folks in China are finding and seeing you. God, I, I just pray that we would get a glimpse of who you are. God, down deep, we, we, were, we want to know you. We were made to know you. We thank you for the church father, Augustine, who said our hearts are restless until they find rest in thee. So Lord, let our hearts find rest today in you. Let us know you. Teach us what it means to rejoice in you. Teach us how to reject the religious impulses, the self-righteousness in our life. Teach us how to lose confidence in our spiritual performance. Teach us to rejoice in you, not in our commitment to you. And help us, oh God, to experience the power that is, that is real to us because Jesus really got out of the tomb. And the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in us. So help us walk in that so that we can suffer well even unto death, Lord. And we trust you to speak to us and show us what that looks like in Jesus' name. Amen.